the impact of Brexit on sterling and on inflation, and then wrap up with a few general remarks about um, uh, what we think the overall impact may have been. Um, I thought actually, funny if I, I would start with a counterfactual, just to show that they have value in both sides of the debate. Um, you will often have heard it said that you know, Brexit uh, led to a collapse in the value of the pound in 2016 in the wake of the, the referendum vote. Um, so what this chart does is it shows a, an index for the value of sterling against a basket of other major currencies uh, weighted according to their importance in, in UK trade. Um, and you see I've marked the period um, in the years before and the years after the, the vote to, to leave the EU. Now, I, I hope you can sort of get two takeaways from this straight away. One is that the, the fall in, in 2016, which actually, by the way, began in, in 2015, actually did little more than reverse the increase in the value of sterling between 2013 and about 2015. Um, and also, in the bigger scheme of things, it, it's nothing remarkable. If you look at this chart too, it's not as if sterling had been a sort of a safe haven currency, rock solid for, for decades. In fact, it had been in long-term decline for about 50 years. If I move on to you know, a possible alternative explanation for why sterling fell, um, I'm not, of course, saying that the result of the referendum didn't have any impact on the, on the timing or the extent of the fall in, in 2016. I mean, clearly, sterling tanked the day after the, uh, the vote came through. Um, instead, my counterfactual is that it probably would have fallen anyway, to some degree, perhaps over a longer time horizon. And to illustrate that, this chart shows what's happened to the UK's current account balance over this period. And that, that basically is the sum of trade in goods and services and various <coughs> investment flows, like the money that we're earning on income, on interest or paying in interest and, and dividends and so on. Um, and you can see, again, I think two key points on this. One is that you know, there had been a very large deficit accumulating ahead of about 2015. So before the referendum, the UK's current account deficit hit about 7% of GDP or national income. That's a, that's a really big number. And it would suggest that you know, sterling at that point was significantly overvalued and, and due for a fall. Uh, and the second point, indeed, lots of people were saying that at the time, including people like the IMF, were arguing that sterling was probably one of the most overvalued of the major currencies. So if it hadn't been Brexit that triggered the fall, it may well have been something else. Um, our next chart is inflation, specifically food prices. Um, now, what I've done here, I've shown the level of food prices because I sometimes think it's easier to see what's going on over a long period rather than looking at the annual inflation rates, but the, um, the story is pretty similar. Um, as it happens, this chart doesn't include the, the numbers that came out earlier today. Um, I did waste about four hours of my life going through those numbers, and if you want to go on my Twitter feed, there's a detailed explanation of the breakdown of what caused the, the jump in inflation. Um, the key point, though, is they don't actually change the, the big picture. Interestingly, food prices rose more in the European Union in February than they did in the, in the UK, despite the shortages of tomatoes and strawberries and, and so on and so on. Um, so my main takeaway instead from this chart is basically the food prices have risen over the last few years by actually slightly less than in the European Union. Uh, but it's not significantly different. Now, you may well be aware of some... You know, academic work suggesting that Brexit might have added 6%, for example, to food prices between 2020 and, and 2022. Um, my, my issue with that is that how do you square that with, with this data suggesting that food price inflation has actually been lower? I think you need to look for maybe alternative explanations for why food price inflation would be lower, or, in my view, suggest that your model actually isn't very good. Um, Turning to, to core inflation, so this is a measure of inflation excluding food and energy. Um, Adam Posen, in particular, has been keen to draw attention to charts like this that do seem to suggest that UK core inflation has picked up further than in the European Union um, since the vote to, to leave the EU. Um, and the logic of doing that is to say that, well, food and energy price shocks were, were common, but what's happening to core inflation is more of a specific UK problem. Um, now, to be fair to Adam, he, he was, I'm afraid, widely misquoted. He was, he was quoted by um, at least one newswire as saying that 80% of the UK's inflation problem was due to Brexit. That wasn't quite what he was saying. What he was saying is 80% of the UK's problem 
in the sense of why our inflation is higher than other countries. So the difference between the two is due to inflation. However, his version of this chart um, only actually started, if I remember right, in, in 2016. So it only showed the period since the, the referendum. Um, I would draw attention to the fact that UK core inflation has almost always been higher than Eurozone core inflation and typically tends to follow that in, in the US for whatever reason. Um, Adam Posen also suggested that if it's not Brexit, what else? Um, I can think actually of, of two reasons. Um, one is energy prices. Now, I know energy prices are excluded from the excluding food and energy measure of inflation, but that only strips out the direct effect. It doesn't pick out, no, strip out the indirect effect of higher energy prices on the cost of doing anything else in the country, including you know, running a restaurant or a shop and so on, all of which are in core inflation. Um, and the second point is the, the policy responses, I mean, particularly during the, the COVID pandemic and even more so in the energy crisis. Um, governments in, in Europe tended to focus on things that reduced measured prices, so for example, cutting VAT. Whereas in the UK, we focused on subsidising incomes, um, which supported real incomes, but didn't affect measured inflation in the same way. Um, next slide is a, a general slide about in this case, comparing the, the UK and Germany. Um, Adam Posen at least got the, the data right. Um, I'm going to have a very quick go here at Mark Carney, who um, produced a very bizarre claim that the UK had shrunk from more than 90% of the size of Germany's economy to, to 70%. Um, that was what we economists call a bit naughty, because he was essentially using market exchange rates rather than purchasing power exchange rates. And I'm pleased that uh, one of the other panel members today, Jonathan Portis, um, also debunked that claim. Um, if instead you simply look at what's happened to the level of, of, of real GDP in the two countries over the last decade or so, again, it, it, it's pretty similar. Our, our growth in particular since 2016 has been actually marginally better than Germany's, but again, not, not significantly different. Um, the UK did underperform during the pandemic. Um, I suspect partly explained by the better measurement of our GDP, as, as Graham mentioned. I think, by the way, that factor is still dragging on the official measure of GDP. It's quite striking how the latest monthly GDP numbers, the ONS statisticians, have gone out of their way to measure how many people were actually going to school, how many children were being educated. So actually looking at the measuring the output of public services rather than simply looking at whether or not teachers are being paid and then concluding that output hasn't changed. So there's a continued measurement problem in there. Um, a few other quick, quick German lessons. Um, I, I need to update this first point because food price inflation in Germany is, is now something like 21, 22 percent. We found out this morning that it leapt to 18 percent in the UK. But the key point is food price inflation is, is higher in Germany than it is in the, in the UK. Um, real wages, um, also really interesting. They, they've fallen by more in Germany over the last three years than they have in the UK. Um, if I was going to push my luck, and in particular if, if Jonathan Portis weren't standing in front of me, I would claim this as a Brexit benefit because it would suggest that you know, labour shortages are actually boosting the wages of, of British workers in sectors like road transport uh, and health and social care. But that leads me to my, my third point, is the extent to which Brexit has caused a sustained loss of EU workers. And it, it's clearly true that you know, a lot of EU workers have, have left or not as many have come here. Uh, since the referendum, uh, and particularly post the pandemic. Um, but if you look at other countries, they have suffered something similar, not necessarily to the same degree, but Germany also saw a big exodus of EU workers during the pandemic, um, and, and many of them have not come back. So I think it's important to compare what's happened in the UK, not just to its own history, but also to what's been happening in, in other countries. Um, so finally, just briefly, some conclusions from, from all of this. Um, I... I think there is a lot of value in, in, in counterfactuals and I, I could actually, if you like, criticise my own side for, for not using them more often. So, for example, I often see Brexiteers saying, look, UK unemployment is a lot lower than unemployment in the EU. That's clearly a success of Brexit, whereas, of course, in practice, UK unemployment has always been lower than that in the UK. Um, but I'm still not a fan of, of, of doppelgangers. I, I appreciate what uh, John and others are, are trying to do. 
But I'm just skeptical of the idea that you could take you know, a group of countries that have performed similarly to the UK over a, you know, a previous period under one set of circumstances and use that as a reliable benchmark for a different period in a very different set of circumstances. Um, I think sometimes Jonathan, John, sorry, um, tends to assume away the impact of COVID and the energy crisis. I think there are good reasons why COVID and the energy crisis might have hit countries in the doppelganger group very differently from those in the UK, including particularly countries like Australia and Canada that are major commodity producers. So, of course, they weren't hit as hard by an energy crisis as the UK was. Um, I'm also aware of what I call here the, the sins of aggregation. A particular you know, hobby horse of mine is when people compare GDP in, um, say, the European Union with that in, in the UK, not taking account of the fact that the EU Union, of course, includes a lot of poorer countries that you might expect to be growing relatively quickly. Uh, and the, even the euro area includes Ireland, where the numbers, of course, are crap. So I think it makes sense to, to compare the UK with individual countries, which is what we tend to do rather than the aggregate. Um, naive extrapolation of short-term trends. I, I think that's a, a criticism, particularly of the some of the some of the work that people have done on looking at what's happening to business investment. And then my sort of two general concerns and, and again i think it'd be fair to criticize both sides of the debate for this from time to time one is sort of too much tunnel vision or, or confirmation bias so you you have a theory that um that brexit has crashed uk trade so you look at the data and look for evidence that trade has fallen and then you attribute that to um to brexit without necessarily thinking of alternative explanations or looking at other countries and seeing if something similar has happened there and then finally, what I call failing a, a, a basic smell test, you know, how, how plausible do you think your numbers are? Um, I think if the doppelganger model had suggested that, you know, GDP is, say, one or two percent lower than otherwise, I would have thought, yeah, plausible. Yeah, I, I could I could run with that. But when it says five and a half percent, then I think that just doesn't doesn't smell right. And I'd want to look deeper into what the analysis behind that is. But that's more than enough for me. Shall I move on?